Okay, hi everyone. Um, today I'm very pleased and excited to have Evan share his work on um, collaborative mo modeling with categorical logic. Uh, but before I let Evan start his talk, I just want to say why I'm so excited to hear this talk. Um, I, I think most of you here know that Evan, uh, for his PhD, started looking at how you can apply categorical logic to statistical modeling. And I, uh, having worked in statistics myself, I think he took, he took uh, the idea of statistical modeling to a whole new level of generalization. And later on, um, Evan started a project to, to use uh, algebraic Julia, to, to use Julia towards scientific modeling. Um, while incorporating categorical logic in, in, in the tools. And there, we see the, the, the practical use of categorical logic towards solving actual problems in science. And, and more recently, Evan has been working on double, categorical, double categories and how they relate to modeling in general. Uh, this is uh, your work with uh, Michael Lambert and uh, Kevin Carlson. And um, so what you're going to hear about today is CAT Colab, which is taking that general theory and exposing it to not just statistical modeling but scient and scient scientific modeling, but to uh, other kinds of modeling as well. And so, uh, Evan, whenever you're ready, uh, very excited to hear yeah. what you have to share with us. Thank you so much, Shevay, for the really generous introduction, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, so um, I want to start by thinking about uh, why, you know, why we do cate applied category theory and wh <coughs> what's it about. Um, and so one thing I've noticed over the years of, of being in the, the business of trying to do translational work um, uh, in applied category theory is that there's a pretty big gap between the way that people who are into this subject um, imagine it and, and the way that people um, who, who aren't um, find it difficult to imagine. So I mean, I think that w once you're into this stuff, it starts to seem really obvious that somehow that, that ideas from this field could dramatically enhance our ability to, to model things in the world and make sense of it. But I find that, that um, uh, to outsiders, it's often really hard for them to imagine in, in, in any reasonably concrete or definite way what that, that might look like and what that could even mean. And I think this, this illegibility that our work sometimes has is a, is a big risk for our community, right? From, from an inside view, I mean, it means that we will struggle to gain legitimacy and resources, and maybe, and more importantly, I mean, taking a, the outside view, I mean, our ideas won't be able to achieve the impact that I believe that they're capable of if, if basically it's not clear um, what they're for. And so I want to start by thinking a little bit about what it means for category theory to be a branch of applied mathematics. Um, so I mean, you could contrast with your, with any of your favorite existing sort of standardized branches of applied math, like Let's take optimization, and convex optimization was one of my favorite things that I studied in grad school. Um, right, so on the one hand, optimization is a, it's a technical field, which, like any technical field, is only understood in a really deep way by, by specialists who work in it. But on the other hand, everyone knows what it's for, right? Everyone knows that optimization is how you make the numbers go up. Um, and it's used by people across a range of fields every day in more or less unconscious ways, right? So like when you fit a statistical model with maximum likelihood or whatever you're doing, like you're using some optimization methods, but you're not really thinking about it so much. It's just part of implicitly what you're doing. And I think that as applied category theorists, we should be able, we should be asking ourselves similarly, you know, what, what is category theory for and who is going to use it and how is it going to um, be part of, com become part of their workflows um, and maybe even, maybe even unconsciously. Um, and I don't claim to know that uh, a definite answer to this, but this is my, my c a, a working answer. So uh, one possible answer is that um, category theory is a branch of mathematics that you can use to represent uh, diverse things, different kinds of things, um, and yet still find connections between them, both within a domain and potentially across different domains. Um, and so if that's the case, I mean, Th this seems to suggest that, that category theory um, will be most useful at a scale um, beyond that of a single individual, right? Because if you're just working on your own, if you can hold everything in your own head, um, maybe you don't need this, this, this superstructure to help organize things. You can just, you can just muddle through. Um, 
um, but it also suggests, uh, it, it explains also perhaps why we have a communication challenge, right? Like, like this answer is a pretty different sort of answer than, than other branches of applied mathematics might give for why people do it. Um, and so this makes me think that, that, you know, category theory is going to, will become legible um, to, to people and it will become useful when it's embodied by technologies that, that make it, that make it usable. And so that, that, that was sort of the, the, the impetus for, for this project, thinking about how can we build more um, usable kinds of, of technologies that, that, are, that take advantage of category theoretic ideas but that don't require lots of specialized um, expertise in the same way that people can use optimization or statistics or all sorts of other things while having varying degrees of, of expertise in those topics. Um, and so, yes? Yeah. Products applied to all kinds of different things. Uh, yeah. We know. Mm -hmm. So ex experience with category yeah. theory sees how to generalize. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think the category theorists love that about the subject. Like, they love to see the connections between things and to see that that generality. But I've actually found that that's like not so easy to sell to people, right? It's like if you just want to do what you do, right? You have a job. You're a chemical engineer. You're a statistician or whatever, like the fact that a bunch of other fields have similar structures inherent in them, I often find just doesn't resonate with people that much. I mean, it resonates with a certain kind of person. But um, I do think we need to be able to give answers about how to help, a peop how to help people do a specific thing. Um, I think that's also very important. Yeah. Um, Right, so in this talk, I'm going to describe a uh, uh, work in progress uh, on um, a project called CAT CoLab, which is supposed to be a collaborative environment for formal, interoperable, and conceptual modeling. That's our, our working slogan. Um, and uh, to expand, I mean, my whole talk will be sort of expanding on different aspects of this, but to, to give some initial gloss on <coughs> what this uh, sequence of words is supposed to mean. We're, so, so by saying that we're doing formal modeling, what we mean is that we're, we're working with um, mathematical objects that are, that are well-defined in some way, and hopefully that, that doesn't mean that they're, they're correct in some, in some strong sense, but it, do, it does mean that, that they, they can at least hopefully be critiqued with clarity. Um, uh, the aim is to have uh, um, interoperable um, modeling so that models within a particular language or even between languages can be um, connected or interoperated with each other. Um, and finally, um, it's supposed to be conceptual, which means that um, you know, the modeling language should be well adapted to concepts that are used by practitioners in certain fields. It should not be that we're, by fiat, like asserting that this is the way that you need to think about your field. It needs th these languages should be well adapted to the way that people um, uh, would like to think about what they do. Um, so for the rest of the talk, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with a, a small um, a demo, and then I'm going to explain some of the mathematics that are behind uh, what you saw. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the design of the system from an from a, um, engineering standpoint, and then I'll briefly conclude. Um, before I go any further, I want to I want to thank the development team for the uh, that was behind the first version of our uh, release, uh, which we did um, uh, last month at the end of last month. So um, the dev team for that release was was Chris Brown, Kevin Carlson, Owen Lynch, and me. Um, and uh, I resisted the temptation to put a ton of other people on, on the slides. Um, because then I would have to make hard decisions about which ones. So I just want to say that that um, uh, a lot of other people have contributed to this work in all sorts of ways, um, with their um, ver being very generous with their ideas and their time. So colleagues here at Topos Institute, as well as our other collaborators and our funders. So I'm I'm grateful to all of them as well. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with um, a little demo. Um, I'm going to show uh, two of the different logics or languages that are currently available in the, in the tool. Um, uh, one, causal loop diagrams, which are a um, thing that comes from the field of systems, system dynamics. 
and also um, uh, database schemas, which is a thing um, uh, that many of us here have worked on in some form or another over the years. Um, there's a link here to you can try it out, provided that our Wi-Fi works. Um, this is also a good point to caveat that that we've been working on the software for about four months now. Um, it, I'm, I'm happy with what we've done so far, but it's it's very young, and so um, you know calibrate your expectations accordingly. Um, so let's see. So I'm gonna. It's always tempting fate to try to do uh, a, a live demo, so we'll see how it goes, but um, here, so, he, so here we go. Um, so here I've put together a, uh, a simple uh, causal loop diagram. So this is a, this is a domain uh, specific language, a very simple one, in which you're basically allowed to postulate um, some different kinds of, of species or variables. So here I'm saying that we're, we're, we're here for the moment we're just replicating a, a very simple classic uh, predator prey model. So we've got, we'll have two different kinds of species, um, rabbits and foxes. The thing that you're allowed to do in, in this language is you're allowed to make links between them. And those links are allowed to have a positive or a negative sign. So um, which are supposed to indicate that, that if you know, the source population uh, goes up, that will, that will have a, all things equal a positive effect on, on, the, on the target population. So, right, so the more rabbits you have, those, those will be eaten by the foxes, and that, that stimulates the fox population. Whereas, you know, the foxes are uh, eating the rabbits, and that's reducing the rabbit population. So there's a negative link from foxes to rabbits. Um, and so uh, in, in this uh, um, causal loop, uh, so in the system dynamics tradition, one of the big things that people want to do with such models, which tend to be, have more, bigger, tend to be bigger than this one, is look for um, feedback loops of different kinds, right? So, so um, this this model has only one uh, feedback loop. It has a balancing or a negative feedback loop formed by uh, traversing um, this this cycle, um, and it and it's a negative feedback because a negative times uh, posi a positive is is negative, um, and um, we can also uh, to try to get some some intuitions for how such a model um, can behave. Uh, we, we have associated with it, uh, a, uh, we can associate with, in, with, with any causal loop diagram um, a, 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 a dynamical system of a, of a currently of a simple fixed functional form. Um, so in this case, we are just replicating the, the we'll start by just like replicating the, the lock couple Terra model. So we can say, okay, let's give ourselves some rabbits and some foxes. Um, we'll say that the Rabbits have some baseline rate of 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 growth. Um, let me start this. Okay. So and then the uh, foxes. Uh, uh, so so in the absence of any interaction terms, um, you know we just have the you know the the rabbit population blowing up uh, exponentially and the foxes dying off. So now we'll, we'll give these interactions some, some, some actual uh, numbers. Um, so if we do that, we can replicate the, um, you know, this is a picture that you've probably seen, maybe seen at some point in your life, the, the kind of the, the oscillatory pattern that you get from, from one of these predator-prey models. Um, but what's fun is that we can, uh, we can start putting on more bells and whistles to this to this model. So I could say, well, you know, this is a model that shows up in every textbook ever written on ODEs, but like what if I want to like do a kind of a different a variant of this or, or start to add on some additional gadgets. So I could say, well, maybe um, we want to have uh, some hunters and what the hunters will do is, uh, well, we're going to assume that there's just some fixed amount of them, and then what they're going to do is, uh, um, well, they'll hunt, they'll hunt the rabbits. Um, actually, no, they'll hunt the foxes. Um, 
So I'll give myself some hunters, and then I can say, okay, well, um, a fixed population of them, and uh, as they, you know, as their ability to hunt increases, you'll see that it affects the dynamics by basically um, driving the fox population into longer troughs. But then, in, at least in this particular dynamics, what happens is that that only causes the rabbit population to explode, which eventually is enough to drag the fox population back up, uh, even though the hunters are hunting them. So at least in this particular dynamics, what it, the, 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 the hunters don't actually eradicate the foxes because, um, you know, because of this, this, uh, these, these loops that are occurring. Okay, so that's, that's one uh, example. And another example I want to show is, that I'll do more briefly, um, is uh, a database schema. So this, I won't spend too much time on this, but this is a fragment of the database schema that's in the cat colib colab backend. Um, uh, we use a Postgres database, and this is what like the schema would look like when framed in our own terms. Um, and so uh, we currently have a very simple backend, which is nice. Um, so basically, we have two kinds of things. Um, we have uh, a table of refs, which are persistent references to documents. So like these, these things are documents. Up to, up to, um, and they have um, UUIDs, which uniquely identify them for all time. Um, and they also have, say, a timestamp at which they were created. But they don't themselves. This table doesn't itself directly contain any content. Instead, um, there's a table of, of snapshots, which contain JSON blobs um, that can be updated at particular times. And, and then the interesting part is how these things are related to each other, right? So, so every, every uh, snapshot is a snapshot of data for some particular ref. Um, and the idea is that, like, as I'm editing this document, um, it's editable uh, live collaboratively. So if you were go to go to this URL, you could edit it. And then and, and periodically, snapshots are being taken of it and saved to, to the database. So at any given time, every ref has a head snapshot, which contains like the latest snapshot. But then you could also have previous ones stored um, to recover old, old versions. OK. So, so those are um, some languages um, that are currently available uh, in the tool. Uh, I'm going to say more about like what's actually going on behind these things, but any any questions about that before I yeah? The <coughs> rabbit the foxes. Yeah. Isn't there something else there with the intensity in which the arrows are being? Yeah, yeah. So so right. So one of the distinctive things about kind of uh, the approach to modeling that we tend to take is to separate separate the um, structural and the quantitative <coughs> features of, of the model, right? So typically in applied math, people jump right to a set of differential equations. They're like, here's my equations, here's the parameters, right? So we, we're saying that, that the structural part is defined here, and then those parameters that you're referring to, I can set them in this table to different things. Um, but but the, this parameterization is happening in an analysis pain, which is independent of the structural description of the, the model. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. It, it would just behave slightly differently. In this, in this quantitative semantics, the, the baseline rates of growth and decay are just like a factor of, of x, whereas the, the edges give rise to quadratic terms. So you would have different. It, it would be a bit different numerically, although both would be different. Yeah, right. So, so, and, and one of one interesting thing to think about are d different ways that one could extend this sort of graphical language with more expressive kinds of quantitative semantics that might exhibit other kinds of phenomenon than what we can produce from from this one. Um, okay, so now I'm going to start to get into into some of the mathematics behind the the, the tool. Um, so the the mathematical foundation that we're currently working with is um, a uh, is called uh, double theories. So this is a 
a framework for doing, a kind of meta framework for doing categorical logic. Um, so a lot of this work is joint with my collaborator, um, Michael Lambert. I put the two, two main references here on the slide. Um, but I'm actually, you know, in, in this talk, um, I'm going to focus only on the aspects of the mathematics that are currently present in the tool. So that's partly a way of keeping myself honest, um, but it also has the benefit that, like, actually we, we we're going to focus on some very, um, s s some, some much simpler things that, than, like, what most of these papers are, are about. So um, hopefully that will also make the talk a bit easier to get into. Um, so the motivation for this uh, is that um, um, different kinds of formal languages or logics are very often the syntactical counterpart to categorical structures. So, so the two really famous examples of this are, th are that like algebraic theories correspond to Cartesian categories, i.e. categories of finite products, and that the typed lambda calculus with products corresponds to Cartesian closed categories. So these were sort of from the beginning of the very beginnings of, of categorical logic. Um, and, um, b but if you're into this stuff, like there are lots and lots of other kinds of examples of this. I put some that, I put a few others here that I happen to like. Um, you, can, you can come up with your own if, if you like this sort of thing. Um, and in many of these, though, though not, not, not all of them, I have to say, um, are, are of these categorical constructors are, are known to be models of double theories that are, are sufficiently I expressive. Um, but as I was saying, so in this talk, we are, we're not going to work with these sorts of logics. We're going to be working with simpler ones. Um, and often, often with, you know, in languages that people often wouldn't consider to be a logic at, at all. Um, and, but part of what I want to suggest is that, like, that category theory can let us take a very big tent perspective of this sort of thing. And, and, and we, we don't have to just think that logic is only about, say, you know, first order logic are very famous f things like we, we, we can we can we can think about lots of different sorts of things as, as being logics um, so I'm, so I'm not going to talk about Cartesian double theories um, which is the sort of thing that you would need to do things of this flavor I'm going to talk about uh, starting with, wh with what I call a simple double theory which is um, nothing other than a, a small strict double category so uh, this is not going to be the sort of talk where I tell you what a double category is, um, but what I will try to do is give you some intuitions about about the roles that they're they're playing in this work. Um, and so, this definition definitely would count as what the InLab calls as a concept with an attitude, right? Because I'm just taking an existing concept and giving it a different name in this particular case, um, which is supposed to suggest a particular way of looking at it. And and the idea here is that the objects of this double category are supposed to represent uh, types of ob uh, uh, types um, in this uh, object types let's say and the arrows or the vertical morphisms are operations so this this is the viewpoint that like if you've seen categorical logic before you've encountered this before this is this is the viewpoint that's present in that whole line of work and what we're saying is that like double theories are like categorified theories so there's another dimension and then this extra dimension, we give morphisms first class status. So, so in addition to having types for objects, which are the objects in the double category, there is a kind of type for morphisms. Those are the pro arrows or horizontal morphisms in the double category. And finally, the two dimensional cells are operations on morphisms, which and by virtue of being um, a cell uh, have include operations on the domain and the, the, on the source and target object types as well. Um, so that's sort of like the very outline of an idea of like what does, you know, how, how can you start to think of a double category specifying some kind of logic that has to do with a categorical structure rather than merely a set theoretic one. Um, and um, so a model of a simple double theory uh, is you can say that it, one way to say it is that it's a, a lax double functor from that into span. 
um, an equivalent statement is that it's a normal lax double functor into, into prof. And again, I'm not going to, uh, if, if you don't know what those are, I'm not going to, to tell you, but what I do want to say is like kind of, um, um, you know, an analogy about like, wh like why, why is this a natural thing to look at, right? So like um, uh, almost all of us around here have thought it, and worked quite a bit with, with uh, co-presheaves, so like set valued functors as a model of, of uh, uh, databases or, or data structures or other combinatorial structures. Um, and, and double theory is one way to think about it is that it, is that it categorifies that, it bumps it up a dimension, right? So instead of having your schema or theory be a category, um, it's now a double category. Instead of the semantics landing in the category set, they land in the double category span which if you're sufficiently into this stuff, you might start to call itself the double category set because that's sort of the role it plays in the theory. Um, and an instance or a model is, is bumped up from being a set valued functor to a span valued um, double functor. And, and due to this increase in dimension, right, a, 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 a double theory will have a, it, it, its, its models will end up being categories with with extra categories or families of categories with extra structure, um, yeah. So, okay, but actually we're going to simplify yet further um, because this is what's currently implemented in the tool, right? So the, cool, the tool currently works with um, discrete double theories. Um, so a discrete double theory, one way to say it is that it's a simple double theory that has only trivial arrows and cells. Um, that is the arrows and cells or identities, or we could say that it's the you know discrete or the horizontal double category on some some category. Um, so, in going back to the interpretation that we had, such a double theory is basically has only types. It has no operations, right? So it has object types and morphism types, and those can obey certain rules of composition, but there are no there are no actual operations on those things. Um, and uh, in this particular special case, there's, there's actually a, uh, a way to, one, one can just say directly what the models are, um, right? So it, in, the, in the special case of a discrete double theory, uh, a model of that theory turns out to be uh, the same thing. So if, if it's the discrete double theory on some category B, a model of the theory turns out to just be the same thing as the category sliced over B. Um, and uh, this, I recently remembered that like, th this, is a, this is a fairly useful special case that people talk about on its own right. So people, in the past couple years, people have started talking about displayed categories for something that's basically what's on the left-hand side of this equivalence. Um, so it, it's, it's a thing that people are, are looking at for, for various reasons, although I'm probably not exactly the ones that are in this talk. Um, Okay, so with, with this, let's revisit our let's revisit our two uh, the two examples that we saw to see uh, like how they're fitting into this framework. So um, causal loop diagrams, uh, which I claim are also mathematically the same as what people in biochemistry call regulatory networks, are um, signed graphs. Um, that is, their graphs for which every edge is equipped with a positive or a negative sign, or um, what is the same, at least at the level of objects, they're, they're free signed categories. Um, and so uh, uh, I'll say a bit more in a bit about why it's useful to think about these as uh, not merely as signed graphs, but as free signed categories, but, but insofar as this is a tool for working with categorical structures. We think of them first and foremost as signed categories. So, um, so to be a bit more precise about this, we can we start with the group of non-zero signs under their usual multiplication, which is people in additive notation. People would call this C two, um, and um, so a signed category is a category that's equipped with a functor into signs, where we view uh, you know, this group as a monoid and then as a category in the usual way. 
Um, so in other words, the category of signed categories is just the slice of cat over this monoid. Um, and uh, so in terms of double theories, the way we, we set this up is that the theory of signed categories is the uh, discrete double theory that's generated by a single object type, uh, let's call it X, and then a morphism type or a pro arrow um, on from X to itself, and I'm calling it N because it's supposed to stand for the negative, uh, the 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 negatively signed morphisms, subject to the equation that N composed with itself is the identity. So what the way to interpret this is that like where is positive here? So so the positive ones are implicitly present via the identity pro arrow on X. That's where the positives are coming from in the theory. And then this equation is saying that a negative times a negative is a positive. Um, so, uh, right, so another way to say this is that the, this theory is the discrete double category on this um, uh, monoid, again, viewed as, as a category. And so by the, the equivalence that we observed earlier, the models of this theory are indeed signed categories. Um, yeah, so why, say, like, like, why not just say that they're signed graphs? Like, what do we do? We really need all this. Well, um, it turns out that that thinking of um, even though at the level of objects, it's enough to think of them to think of causal loop diagrams as signed graph. It, it's 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 useful to think of them as free signed categories because you get a different notion of, of morphism, right? So if we take um, morphisms in the category of signed categories, like so those are like, let's say, signed functors, signed preserving functors, that, that is a useful notion for talking about motifs. So in the demo, I showed briefly that like you could find um, different ki feedback loops of different polarity in the, in the diagrams, and that's accomplished in the following way. So a uh, uh, starting from this this simple uh, or this this very small um, <coughs> um, loop diagram, uh, we can say that the um, positive or reinforcing feedback loops uh, are the reinforcing is the term that people in systems dynamics use, are are, are the morphisms um, out of this, and, sim and similarly, the negative ones are the are the morphisms out of the 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 walking negative loop, basically. And then it's these the rules of of comp sign composition are what ensure that like this makes sense, right? So like like a a loop that goes from positive to negative, like we saw in the demo, that is indeed a a morphism uh, out of this due to the the rules of of sign composition. Okay, and although this is just one example, I want to claim that this phenomenon is is basically generic, right? That the diagrams are um, generically free categorical structures, and the reason, right, is that like right, all you know, people are always drawing pictures, right, in science and engineering and, and all sorts of places. You know, people draw pictures to convey what they mean. Those pictures often have arrows in them, and and like usually there's a sense in which it makes sense to think about composites of those arrows or following paths in those diagrams. And I claim that whenever that's the case, you should be thinking that like this diagrammatic language is really talking about free categorical structures of, 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 of some, some kind because there's implicitly a sense of composition. So like uh, if you're into this stuff, you'll know that like a very famous example of this is that like Petri nets of different flavors or either the free or the or, or the free symmetric or commutative monoidal or monoidal categories, right? So that that's a thing that will be coming in a in a future version of Cat Colab. And I think there are probably there are lots of other examples that are are less famous, but they're there if you're willing to look for them. Um, yeah. I was wondering if I could get a summary of yeah. the tools that I built. Yeah, slide, please. Just yeah. Right at it. Yeah. So Oops. Very cool. Yeah. In Cat Collab, we use the discrete double theory. 
Yes. Which means that the vertical bits are not here yet. Yes. Which means I, I, I think to me I'm like, I kind of have a flavor of what the vertical bits would mean, but yeah. maybe not so much. Yeah. So it's going on in the horizontal. Okay, yeah, so then we're like, discrete, we have discrete double theory. Yeah. And then you gave an example of like the sine graph. Yeah. Uh, they well, so they live as models of models. yeah, okay. yeah. And yeah. similarly, you said that models of discrete double theories are also just categories with a yeah. So so, so specifically, the the sign graphs are are free models of a particular double theory. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Cool. Uh huh. So that all sounds okay, good. One more step. One more step is like okay. So this one, for example, like what's even the point of yeah. thinking about this from a category theory perspective? Yeah. Yes. Like between sign graphs, there's an obvious categorical definition yeah. of what that would be, yeah. and it's really useful. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Do I have a, <coughs> you have a need to think about functions between double categories? Um, yes. Um, so uh, essentially, for the reason that, like, if you want to interoperate between different logics, uh, a good starting point for that would be to look for double functors between the double theories and to, well, in the simplest case, you could pull back along them or you could, if you're bold, look for, for a junction. So again, that, that would be basically seeking to categorify the, uh, the version of the uh, functorial data migration story, essentially. Will your language accommodate that? Um, in some form and just and, and st initially in very simple forms and over time perhaps in more expressive ones. But yes, that's absolutely part of the, the uh, plan, although I haven't highlighted it because it's not visible in the tool yet. Yeah. That's a great question though. Thanks for asking. Um, okay, so uh, more briefly I want to talk about, say a bit about the other example that we saw. So database schemas um, uh, there are different flavors um, of database schemas in the literature on categorical databases. A nice simple one is to say that a database schema is um, a profunctor that let's say is finitely presented and the interpretation that one has is that like the source of that profunctor is like the uh, uh, category of entity types and of mappings or foreign keys between those and the target of that profunctor are like the attribute types so like string or json or whatever and and the um the morphisms in those are like operations on attributes um like negation of booleans or something and then the the heteromorphisms that connect these together are the actual data attributes which take you from the world of of entities which are like abstract uh, things to like to the concrete world of specific data values um, and uh, this is a uh, actually an, an even simpler double theory um, uh, than before um, so if we uh, take the interval category and then look at the discrete double category on that that's what we might call the walking pro arrow um, so it's the discrete double theory that's freely generated by um, two objects and a prover between them. Um, and a model of such a, a, a theory uh, is a profunctor, um, either basically directly by the definition that I gave of a model as a, say, a normal prof valued functor. Um, or um, you can also see this indirectly via our, our uh, our equivalent description of these models, right? So like, uh, it's kind of a classic fact that, that for example, Joyal explains on his InLab page how, how um, categories sliced over the interval category um, are the same as profunctors. Um, so this is a good place to start to explain like where like that vertical structure in the double theories can start to be useful to do um, more things. So the second bullet point here, right, in the paper that David and others wrote on algebraic databases, what you want to say is that like this category of attribute types um, 
it really ought to have like products and stuff because like you want to be able to talk about operations like you know adding two numbers right and that's that's a binary operation so you know once you have more uh, in, in in a in a non-discrete double theory particularly like in a Cartesian double theory you could start to say well I'm gonna give my I'm gonna give this codomain uh, double cat I, I will arrange my theory in such a way that that um, models have the codomain of this profactor being um, you know Cartesian categories it's the sort of thing you can do um, and then in, in more immediately one of the things that I hope we'll be working on over the next couple months is doing um, database instances so um, we have a generic notion of a of a module or an instance over a model and um, we'll be looking to explicate that and implement some again probably initially restricted version of that idea um, okay so that concludes the the math bit of the talk so in the last 10 or so minutes um, I want to talk a bit about the um, design of the tool yeah yeah Yeah. <coughs> um, so you have that drop down in the end package. Yeah. <coughs> is, is R3 a class from C a double theory? Yes. Okay. So double theory, um, or probably the binary for the Bitcoin network, mm -hmm. is the big C double theory um, of um, and, and C and C2. Yeah, yeah, Z2. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the theory is the walking program. Yeah. And you're walking out. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, how does the stuff about like entities and attributes come into that? Yeah. So. So. Uh, maybe I'm not sure. Uh, or. Like you are you asking? Yeah. Okay. So. So, so right. So. Yeah, so, so like if we had just taken our double theory to be the trivial double theory, right. which has yeah. one object and trivial arrows, for arrows and cells, um, then a model would just be like uh, a, ca a category. What you call o -logs, yeah. Which is what we call O logs, right. but which we can also think of as an even simpler model of a database in which we don't distinguish between entities and attributes. But it's very useful in practice, like indeed in like my example here like if you want to talk about the way this stuff works in SQL database like the entities are the things that correspond to tables and the attributes correspond to, to value to columns so like you it's it's like quite important to like tease these apart and so to do that we we can we can you soup up your theory from being the trivial one to like the walking pro row yeah uh-huh You could, yeah, so in this, you, you could make a map from timestamp to JSON, but you couldn't, with this current setup, say that there's an addition operation on numbers. So, yeah, so unary operations are limited utility in, in that setup, but. There is a generic, uh, this is something that Kevin and I have been, have just finished working out that I think the remaining details of. There, there's a generic notion of a, mo of, an, of a module or an instance over a model of an arbitrary double theory, which is a fun topic, but perhaps not one I want to get into right this moment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna up my pace a little bit here. So, so no, no, no problem. I'm, I'm glad. I'm very glad. I'm very glad to have the, the questions. Um, I may just eat a little bit into my Q and A time. Um, so, uh, right. So I want to talk a bit about the design of, of the tool, right? Be, because, you know, there, there's like a, a a big leap, not just in terms of like the engineering work that you have to do, but, but even in thinking about like what, what does the thing look like? Like how do we want to interact with it? 
um, going from like the sort of math that I just presented to to the demo. So I think, you know, this is a creative process that I think we, we need to take seriously around here and I want to spend some time just, you know, talking about some of the, the thoughts that, that went, went into, the, into this. So, um, uh, right, so, so as I sort of hinted at the beginning of the talk, right, we, the, the goal of the system is to enable formal and operable conceptual modeling, um, but under a, a pretty specific set of assumptions. So like on the one hand, I'm perfectly willing to assume that the user knows something about a domain of interest that we know how to build logics for, right? So like, so, you know, you know, maybe they know about causal loop diagrams or database schemas or they have, so, so it's, it's not supposed to require no knowledge, but it, it's, it's not supposed to, but what it's not supposed to require is knowledge of this metalogical foundation that I just described, right? I told it to you because this is what we talked about at, at Tovas, but like, but like that's sort of like, in some sense, like you are not the in, intended, intended audience for the tool, right? So the sort of people that, I mean, I mean, you might be, but, but in particular, I would also like to include uh, other kinds of people, right? So various kinds of scientists, engineers, um, people who, you know, are, make pol policy, um, maybe like, you know, different local experts or stakeholders. Like, the, I, I, I'm hoping that the tool can, can cast a, a, a wide net. Um, as for what kind of a thing the tool actually is, um, CatColab is a structure editor. Um, so um, what that means is that like the content that you're editing is not a string of text, right? So like in VS Code, what you're editing is a string of text and although it has all sorts of fancy features, at the end of the day, the thing that you're editing is still a string of text. Um, um, in CatColab, you're editing a structured object uh, or structured objects, um, such as a model of a, a double theory. Um, and I think this is a, this is not a, the idea of structure editors is not new by any means, but I think it's a bit, a bit under, under explored. I mean, be, I think it interpolates in an interesting way between text editors and like a fully graphical editor, um, you know, like, like a diagrammatic tool where you draw links between boxes and stuff. And the nice thing is that unlike a text editor, it can provide more scaffolding um, and get closer to ensuring that the model you that build is syntactically, at least syntactically correct by con construction because it actually knows something about the thing you're editing, right? So if I go in here and say like, uh, I wanna actually capitalize these, like I can update these here and it immediately updates everywhere in the application um, uh, because like the underlying data structure is, is linked together in, in a way that like a, a, a text field isn't. Um, but on the other hand, unlike a graphical editor, there seems to be some hope of doing structure editing like generically across things, right? So Dana at the beginning asked about like, wasn't well, the point about being general, right? It's sort of like the point is about it, it's somehow about both. It's about trying to be specific when you need to be, but but have enough generality that we can parameterize a structure editor over different logics and yet still have it within a particular logic feel ergonomic and be well adapted to the the language at hand. And that and, and like you know, insofar as the UI is exploring a research question, I think one of the questions that it's exploring is like, can you actually do that? Like, does it really, th th does it work? Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, so in terms of the user interface, you'll have noticed that we're currently have like um, some kind of notebook style interface. Um, so like I've been talking about formal modeling, um, but like I think I don't want to be misunderstood as saying that everything can or should be formalized, right? So like informal narrative is an indispensable part of communication, it always will be, um, right? So like like here, you know, like like other notebook interfaces that allows you to intermix, you know, um, you know, rich text with the, the formal elements. And again, you've probably seen tools like this. One thing to note though, is that like, although the interface probably looks familiar from computational notebooks um, such as Jupyter, 
um, the, the execution model, so to speak, here is, is very different. So like in a Jupyter Notebook, you have a sequence of code cells that can execute individually, potentially out of order, and they produce side effects, which then affect other cells when they subsequently execute. Um, so a cat collab notebook is not, uh, does not work like this. Like a, 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 a single notebook, right, such as what's shown on the left here, is a declarative specification of a, of a single structure. Um, and the order of the cells is entirely irrelevant. So like I don't, ha I, I could put, you know, this declaration first, even though I define this down there. It, do it doesn't matter. The, um, it is purely a, a matter of human understanding the way you want to organize this, th these cells. So that's quite different than, than many computational notebooks. Um, uh, getting to um, some of the, so, so part of what I think, one of the most confusing aspects of this whole business is the fact that there are a number of different levels present in the system and, and keeping your levels straight and dealing with the level shifting is, 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 is tricky. So like um, part of the way, part of the reason why I'm bringing up at this point in this talk is to kind of explain the current boundary that we're trying to draw um, in terms of like what we expect a typical user to interact with and what we expect, you know, only a, a power user or, or our, ourselves to be, to be doing, right? So like the, Lower dimensional things here um, at dimensions one and, and zero are the models and, and in the future, the instances. So like this is stuff that will be uh, present in the user interface for users to interact with and work with. Um, at the moment, the, the, the theories are not uh, exposed in the graphical interface in any way. You've got to write some code to, to specify them. And then in the background of all that, there's even this mathematical stuff about, well, there are different kinds of theories, like, like simple ones and Cartesian ones and so forth. And, and that we're not even attempting to, to systematize at, at this time, possibly ever. So, so there's this hierarchy. Um, and uh, there's, um, uh, and there's, there's really a lot here to, to explicate and, and explore and, it, and, uh, so between all these different things, there are also morphisms. And then in the tool, you can see something currently which is not even fitting into this formal structure at the moment, which is we have these analyses, which are more um, sort of ad hoc ways of attaching outputs, be they visualizations or other kinds of things, to, to models. Um, so the, this is like a little bit of the on ontology, so to speak, of the tool. Um, I want to show one last, so in the spirit of eating my own dog food, here is um, like an olog of description of some of this stuff. Um, and I do think that the notebook interface drives pretty well with the, the like olog guidelines that one is supposed to write them as if they were sentences because you can just sort of like read these as sentences. You can read like a morphism of theories has as source a theory and things like that. Um, so this is another kind of view on what I was showing in tabular form there, um, to some of the different levels of, of, that are present, either explicitly or implicitly, in what we're doing. Um, okay, so I'm I'm going to wrap up this last bit very briefly. If you're interested in this sort of thing, the tool is written in a mixture of Rust and TypeScript. We use we build the TypeScript, uh, the, the front end and the UI and TypeScript, but we use um, Rust compiled to WebAssembly in the browser. So we can actually write the, so what's pretty cool is that we can write the, the, the mathematical meat of this in, in, in Rust, which is a nice modern programming language, but it actually executes in, in the browser. So most of the computation, like including this ODE solving, all that's happening in the browser. We have no backend compute supplying that right now. Uh, okay, I'll skip the architecture diagram. Uh, I want to I want to close with uh, a comment about like the overall sort of viewpoint here. I mean, I think that you know if you look at the history of the field of computer science, I mean, what you see is that it's been driven again and again by search for universality. Whether it's like looking at universal computation or universal Turing machines at the very beginning, through a whole you know decades and decades of of people 
seeking to invent a, the, the, a universal um, programming language or modeling language that would subsume all others. Um, nowadays, people are talking about artificial general intelligence, again, with a sort of universalizing dream. And, and, and I, I would like to advocate for a different pr perspective. Um, uh, I think that rather than looking for um, a single thing to subsume all things, um, we should be looking for ways to create um, small languages and logics that are that are really well adapted to their purpose. That, um, um, but they don't try to do more than that, and then, and then use the ideas of category theory to prevent those from becoming islands, right? To try to to try to connect them together into webs of of shared understanding, or or maybe not, maybe disagreement, but at least hopefully legible disagreement, and and that's sort of the the uh, uh, one of the animating motivations for me behind this project. So thanks everyone for, for listening. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Dynamic systems depend upon feedback. I didn't quite see how you formally handle time in your talk to the matter. How I've, ah, um, so yeah, I, I, I didn't talk too much about this. Um, so uh, the time, right, so, so time is, is not explicitly present in this particular description of the, in, in this description as a causal loop diagram. You, time doesn't actually show up until you get the um, ODE semantics. Um, yeah, but there are other flavors of that, uh, that's not the only way to do things. Um, th there, there are, there is also interest in system dynamics and other communities, and and having, you know, more of the quantitative aspect par part of, of of the model specification itself, and not just in the semantics. So there are interesting things to think about there. But one yeah. part of Turing is being desperately used for better formalism. Hmm. Yeah. I. Yeah. Well, I certainly enjoyed listening to their talk here in the seminar. So yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. Yeah. I I know of that you person. I don't know the paper probably. Right? I don't know that. Yeah. The point is like instead of theories of everything, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. I'll have to take a look at that. Thanks for the pointer. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have like a, like, as almost like, do you have a laundry list of things that can be captured by just discrete double theory and then these things that can't be? It's like something you're like, wow, we would need to match that to this. Yeah. Um, so I, I gave one example in the talk in the con, I gave a couple, I gave two examples in, in the talk, but maybe, maybe this is a good one to, to hone in a little more on, because I didn't say too much about how that would work. So like, um, right, so we want to get something like PetriNets into the system. And the from the viewpoint of this project, a natural way to think about PetriNets is that they're free SMCs of some kind. And um, uh, the to talk about something like a, um, right, the way the way you would want to do something like one way you would want to do something like SMCs and with double theories is to say, like, I have um, some uh, some arrow um, in the theory, which is like an operation on objects, and then by the by the the nature of these things, this will come with um, an external identity thing, and so it also will include the the tensor operation on on the morphisms as well, but but to even but to, to, so, so to start to write these sort of things down, you need to have operations in your double theory and that. So here you see you see you need two things. You need operations first of all, and you also need some way to talk about products if you want to if you want to to, to yeah. So that's one way. So one way to do petri nets would be to to go in that direction.
Yeah, right. So an interesting aspect of this is that Petri nets seem to potentially live at two different levels in the system, right? Because you could, you know how we do Petri nets, right? Now it's very Julia, right? We could do that. We could have like the schema for 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 like a whole grain Petri net, and then an instance of that would be one, would be one of those. And in some sense, they're the same. This gets back to like, you know, this gets to like what are the morphisms, right? Because like the um, uh, What's cool about thinking of Petri nets as um, free SMCs is that you get a richer notion of morphism, which basically says, like, I can map a Petri net to another by taking a uh, uh, transition and basically sending it to, like, a whole wiring diagram, um, which is, a, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah.